I want to introduce you, reintroduce some of you this morning to four persons. Uh, these four imaginary persons, some of you may have met before, others of you might find them entirely new. I do want to say they are imaginary, and therefore any resemblance to people real, real that you know is entirely coincidental. The first person is John. Now, John says that he loves Jesus, but he's not into church. He's not a fan of what he calls organized religion. And so John says that the best way that he experiences God, communes with God, is by going out to the desert on the weekends, and he camps out there, walks in the dunes, and there in nature, that's where he enjoys God the most. But he doesn't really like to go to church. Uh, the second person is Jaya. Now, Jaya is different from John. She actually goes to church a lot. In fact, Jaya goes to four different churches every week. Uh, she goes to one church because she loves the praise and worship band and the music that they have. She enjoys it. She goes to another church because the message is always relevant and helpful for her life. Uh, she goes to yet another church because they have a great children's ministry program and she wants to make sure that her children uh, can be instructed through that program. And then finally she goes to a fourth church which is an ethnic fellowship of people from her same language and ethnicity and there she enjoys her real kind of fellowship and, and meeting with other believers. That's Jaya. The third friend that we're going to meet this morning, I, I told you some of, them have met, some of you have met these people before, is Paul. Now Paul is a single guy in his late 20s and for Paul it's all about the worship experience. So he goes to a church where he can have the lights out, eyes closed, lift up his hands, doesn't care who's around him, loud music, and he just wants to get lost in the experience, in the feeling that he's having there. And as soon as it's finished, he darts out, heads home. Sometimes he'll join the, uh, this little group of singles that meet for Bible study on the weekends if uh, he has time. Finally, our fourth person is Olu. Olu. Now, Olu is all about power encounters and deliverance ministry and the Holy Spirit and casting out demons. And he wants to get together with groups that practice these things. As far as church goes, I'm not that interested because, you know, you're mingling with people who don't really care about deliverance or don't really have the Holy Spirit. And, you know, I introduce these people at the start of every one of our new members' classes. It's one of my favorite things to do at ECC is teach that class. And I ask the question, what do these four persons have in common? And usually we go around the room, get different answers, but we finally come to kind of a shared understanding. All four of them claim to be Christians. All four of them claim to follow Jesus. But I want to share and submit that all four of them have a fundamental misunderstanding of the Christian life. Because they see no place for church in their life, belonging to a church. Well, this morning, brothers and sisters, we're starting a new sermon series called Rediscovering Church. And we'll be going through this series in parallel with our sermon series through the letter to the Hebrews. That will continue as well. The reason is the past three years of the global pandemic interrupted the normalcy of life in every sphere, but especially of church life. We've been through a tumultuous and stormy time. And around the world right now, many Christians have become confused about what the church is and why the church matters. Church shopping and church hopping and virtual church have become kind of ubiquitous. You know, for ECC, we've celebrated 50 years as a church, and we're returning to normal. And it's just been hardly two months since we could finally see one another's faces in worship. And as we continue into normalcy, as the church comes back, as many people have been saying, the elders believe that this is a great time for us to revisit and rediscover God's design for His church, His blueprint for His church. You know, some of you have been here for many, many years as faithful members of ECC. And we've gone through many changes and transitions and a lot of teaching and change in the church. And for many of you, you've embraced that 
and you love it and you see that it's brought a lot of fruit. Others of you have been here for a long time and these changes and transitions have happened and you've struggled with those things and wondered why. Why did we do this? Or why are we doing that now? Why is it different? Some of you are brand new and some things that we do here at ECC might be very foreign to you, might seem peculiar or even strange to you. Yet others wish that you could be more equipped to be able to better explain and understand why we do things that way that we do them here at ECC. Brothers and sisters, if that's you, this series is for you. This series is for all of us. It's for the children who want to know why do we go to church. And we're going to spend time together to listen again through this series to what God's word says concerning his church. But more importantly, to grow to love God's church, especially the particular local church in which he's placed you. Well, this morning we begin our series with two questions, right, that we're going to ask and answer. Two key questions. The first question is one of definition, and the second question is one of affection. So the first question is simply, what is a church? What is the church? Definition. The second question is, why should we love the church? Affection. So let's begin. What is the church? What do we mean by church? How do we define this thing we call church? Well, the word church is the translation of the Greek word ekklesia, ekklesia, which is used 114 times in the New Testament. And that word simply means assembly. That word is used with reference to just a gathering of people, even with no reference to the church. It's not a special word. It, It means in the normal usage, an assembly of people. So the church is fundamentally an assembly. Let me read to you this very short statement from our uh, statement of faith. It's brief and to the point, but very clear of what we believe at ECC concerning the church. Listen, we believe the church is composed of all who have placed their faith in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. The local church is a congregation of believers united by a covenant of faith and fellowship of the gospel. And that little statement actually gives us two very clear usages of the word church that have been very common throughout church history. And theologians, uh, biblical teachers, have always seen this. You might have heard these terms before. The universal church and the local church. Or the universal heavenly assembly and the local earthly assembly. Let's think about both of these things. First, the universal church. What is the universal church? Uh, One person defines it like this. The universal church is the heavenly assembly of all the elect people of God across time and space who belong to Christ and his kingdom. The heavenly assembly of all the elect people of God across time and space who belong to Christ and his kingdom. This includes all believers past who have gone into glory and all believers around the world today, true believers. And the way that this universal church has always been explained, described, is through four attributes that you'd find from the earliest days of the church. Uh, The early church fathers described it like this. One holy Catholic or universal and apostolic church. One holy, universal, and apostolic church. Let's go through each of those attributes one by one to get a fuller understanding. First, the church is one. Is one. Look at Ephesians 4, verses 4 to 6. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. The church is one because God is one. And to speak of this oneness of the church describes the fellowship, the bond that all true believers around the world and throughout history share because of the Holy Spirit. So I don't know if you've ever had this um, happen to you, like, you know, you meet someone somewhere random, where you've never been before, and you meet someone you haven't met before, and then you find out that they're also a born-again Christian, a believer in Christ, 
And all of a sudden, there's this spark of connection. And, and you feel like you're talking to family. You know, I experienced this back in 2008. I moved to Canada, a new country, as a single man to work as an engineer. And I didn't know anyone hardly in the city. I felt so alone. And then I had researched on the internet before moving which church I was going to attend. And I remember going to my first church gathering. And I met all these Canadian people whom I'd never known. And immediately I felt, this is my family. That's because the church is one. This is why at ECC it's also very important for us to maintain and strengthen unity and fellowship uh, with all true gospel preaching churches in this building, in this city, in this country. This is why I give a measure of my time to serve as the chairman of the Council of Evangelical Churches to foster relationships and fellowship between various churches and pastors. So that's the first attribute, the oneness of the church. Second, we said one holy church. The church is holy and must be holy because God is holy. Even as we sang, he is holy, holy, holy. And he fills his people with his holiness. My brothers and sisters in Christ, if you have trusted Christ in faith, you are united to him by faith, then his holiness is your holiness. He gives us his holiness. He declares us to be holy. Every Christian, every true believer, this is your identity. You are a holy saint. That word saint comes from the word sanctified. You have been sanctified, set apart from the world, devoted unto God and his purposes. And the church itself, corporately, all of us together, as the bride of Christ, the church is holy, reflects God's holiness. One, holy. Third, Catholic or universal. Now, sometimes we get nervous with that word, Catholic. Some people think, oh, this is talking about Roman Catholicism. Are we becoming Roman Catholic now? Not really. Sometimes Protestants will read the early church creeds, and the early church creed says, we believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church, and they think that that's talking about the Catholic church, and therefore the creeds belong to Roman Catholics. That's not true. The word Catholic comes from a Greek word which simply means universal. Right? Universal. And the way that Roman Catholics define Catholic and the way that Protestants define Catholic is completely different. So Roman Catholics define Catholic as being all those who submit to the authority of the Pope in Rome. All right? All those who submit to what they call the uh, magisterium of Rome under the authority of the Pope. And we would say that's actually not a biblical use of being Catholic. That's not true Catholicity. We would say, and the Protestant reformers taught this, and we would affirm this here at ECC, that to be Catholic in the true sense, to be truly universal, is all those who have believed and submit to the true gospel as revealed in God's word across space and time. So all believers past who have believed the true gospel, believed in the word of God, and all believers around the world today who believe in the true gospel compose the heavenly, universal, Catholic assembly of God, church of God. And of course, the greatest picture of this Catholic universal church is seen in Revelation chapter 5, where we see at the end people from every tribe and tongue and nation, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, standing around the throne and saying, worthy are you. To receive praise as the finished product of the work of Christ. That's what it means to be Catholic, to believe and hold the true gospel together with all other churches. The, the final attribute of the universal church is that it is apostolic. So it is one holy, Catholic, universal, and apostolic church. And to be apostolic simply means that we are founded upon and remain faithful to the word of God delivered by the apostles. All right, The church is founded upon the word and remains faithful to the word of God. Now again, our Roman Catholic friends defined apostolic differently. They would say apostolic means there's a long line of popes, of men, uh, who go all the way back to the apostles, all the way back to Peter. And first of all, that claim is, uh, can be easily shown to be uh, erroneous historically. It's quite disputable that there is that line. But secondly, we would say that more important than a line of men is a long line of teaching. 
of teaching. And we would say to be apostolic means that we are in continuity with the teaching of the word of God, the same that the apostles taught and wrote for us as they were inspired by the Holy Spirit. So that's the universal assembly or universal church, one holy Catholic and apostolic church. And when you and I are born again, when we become Christians, when we come to faith in Christ, we become members of this universal church, this heavenly assembly. God brings us, out, brings us out of the kingdom of darkness, brings us into his kingdom of light, and we become part of this universal assembly, become members of it. But our membership in this invisible heavenly assembly must become visible on earth. And the universal heavenly assembly, the universal church, becomes visible physically on earth and is displayed physically on earth through local chapters of this universal church, particular embassies of this heavenly assembly, which are called local churches. Local churches. If you read the New Testament, you'll see that most of the New Testament was written to local churches. Paul is writing to the church of God in Corinth, or the church of God that is in Ephesus, as we're seeing today. And every local church is in itself fully a church in the eyes of God. Every local church is a display of the universal church on earth, is fully before God, his church. So how do we define then a local church in distinction from a uni the universal church? And again, as we go back to the history of the Protestant Reformation, as they sought to uh, bring the church back into the uh, alignment with the word of God, the Protestant reformers gave us some helpful ways to understand what a true local church is. And it's based upon what they say that I'm giving you this definition. Uh, so what is a local church? Here's a definition for you. A congregation, a local church, is a congregation an assembly of baptized believers who are in covenant relationship with one another to gather, to, to gather together regularly under the right preaching of God's word and to affirm one another's faith through a right practice of the ordinances or sacraments to live together as the body of Christ. That's a whole mouthful. Don't worry, we'll be unpacking that over several weeks. Let me give that to you again. It's a congregation of baptized believers who are in covenant relationship with one another to gather together regularly under the right preaching of God's word to affirm one another's faith through a right practice of the ordinances or sacraments and to live together as the body of Christ. Those two marks are crucial that the Protestant reformers in the 16th century sought to distinguish a true church from the Roman Catholic church by saying, true churches are marked by the right preaching of God's word and a right administration of the sacraments or ordinances. It's always God's word that creates the church, you see. God creates by his word. We see in Genesis 1, he speaks and all of creation comes into being. God constitutes the nation of Israel as his people by speaking his law at Mount Sinai through Moses, his prophet. You have this beautiful picture in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 37, where Ezekiel the prophet is told to prophesy God's word to a valley of dry bones and then those bones come alive with flesh and spirit and they become an, an exceedingly great army. That's a picture of how God creates his church. It's by the preaching of his word. And so where the true preaching of God's word is present, where people gather around that, that's where a true church is present. But furthermore, local churches are defined by a right practice of the ordinances or sacraments, baptism and the Lord's Supper. Jesus said, go into all the world and make disciples, baptizing them. So local churches will mark themselves off from the world through baptism and the Lord's Supper. In baptism, uh, we are portraying both baptism and Lord's Supper as signs of what the gospel does. In baptism, uh, a believer is symbolizing their death to the old life and their resurrection in Christ, that Christ has cleansed them and made them new, and the church is affirming that believer's profession of faith. In the Lord's Supper, we are coming together and affirming one another. It's a family meal in which we affirm one another as fellow members of the fam family and declare what Christ has done for us. Remember what he's done for us together. 
So that's a little bit about definition, right? What is a church? That's some instruction for you, definitional uh, things. And as we go through the series, we'll unpack each part of that definition. But really this morning, I don't want to stay in the realm of instruction and definition. No, I want us to move from definition to affection. To affection. And that leads to our second big question this morning. Why should we love the church? Why should we love the church? Friends, did you know that God loves his church? Jesus loves, passionately loves his church. The church is dear to him. The church is precious to him. Charles Spurgeon once said, the church is the dearest place on earth. And so she should also be dear to us. The rest of our time together this morning, I want to show you three reasons from Ephesians why. Why should we love the church? First, the church is the display of God's wisdom. The church is the display of God's wisdom. You know, the book of Ephesians lays out for us in breathtaking beauty the plan of God from all eternity to save sinners. You come to Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3 and Paul says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places having chosen us before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him. This means before God said, let there be light. Before Genesis 1.1, God set his love upon you, dear Christian, upon us and determined that he would save us and make us his own and present us before him holy and blameless. As we keep reading Ephesians, it continues into chapter 2, telling us how we were saved, that we were dead in our trespasses and sins, by nature children of wrath, but God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, made us alive together with Christ and raised us up with him and seated us in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in ages to come he might show us the surpassing riches of his grace and mercy towards us in Jesus Christ. By grace you have been saved through faith, not of works that no man may boast." And as you keep reading chapter 2 and you come towards the end of chapter 2, you see this amazing fact. Verse 19, Paul says, So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. So God's plan is not just to save sinners as individuals. No, but we sinners are saved to be a people a family, a household. As you keep reading chapter 3, Paul begins to lay out his calling as an apostle. And he says this in chapter 3, verses 7 and following. He says, Of this gospel, I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given me by the working of his power. To me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things so that through the church the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was according to the eternal purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord. What is Paul saying here? Well, Paul is saying that God's eternal plan was a mystery. And this was hidden in God for many ages. It was revealed partially and and a little bit in the Old Covenant as God worked out his plan. But now it has been fulfilled and it is declared to all in Christ. What is this plan? Well, under the Old Covenant, God was working with a specific people. If you read your Bible beginning in Genesis, we'll see that Adam and Eve sinned and then God begins his plan to save a people. He makes a promise and a covenant with a man named Abraham uh, and his family. And then he constitutes the nation of Israel to be his people, to live in covenant with him. And it looks like God's saving plans are going to work through this nation state named Israel. But what was hidden, what was a mystery, 
was that God had a plan all along that one day his own son, our Lord Jesus Christ, the son of God, would come and be born in the line of Israel, from the, among the people of Israel. And he would die on a cross, shedding his blood for the sake of sinners, for sins to be forgiven, and rise from the dead, defeating Satan, sin, and death. And in him and through his gospel, all nations would be blessed. Not only would they be blessed with the forgiveness of sins, but they would be brought in to the people of God. So that now God's people consists of all people everywhere from every tribe and tongue and nation, both Jew and Gentile from all nations who believe in Christ. The church is the people of God in Christ. And, and did you catch what Paul was saying in verse 10? He's saying, as this plan has been fulfilled in our Lord Jesus Christ, all of this has taken place so that, verse 10, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. I don't know if you realize how amazing that statement is. Just think about what he's saying here. Listen. God Almighty, the creator of heaven and earth, the infinite almighty God wants to display his infinite wisdom to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms, to angels and to principalities and powers and spiritual beings. God is going to show them his wisdom. There are a number of ways that the Lord could do this. You know. he, he could take them into the Himalaya mountains above 20,000 feet elevation and show them the snow leopard, one of the rarest creatures on planet Earth, show them the snow leopard giving birth and say, behold my wisdom. God could take us to the bottom of the Pacific Ocean, 36,000 feet under sea level and, and show us the thousands of sea creatures that no eye, human eye, has ever seen or even discovered and, and, and say, look at all of these, behold my wisdom. He could take us into outer space, he could take us past the Milky Way and show us the millions, billions of galaxies and stars, all of them that he has created and put in place by his word and say, behold my infinite wisdom. But here Paul is telling us that there is something greater than all of that. That God chooses to show off his great and magnificent and glorious and infinite wisdom by bringing the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places to the local church right here to ECC and showing us Brother Raj and Sister Sarah and showing us Cameron Zamora and Pius and Lata and saying, this is the display of my wisdom. These people whom I have bought with the blood of my son and brought together to be one family in Christ, that's my infinite wisdom. Behold my wisdom. Right here, brothers and sisters, do you see it? Do you see it? Do you behold the manifold wisdom of God displayed in his church, in our life together? When you think about the church, does it take your breath away? It really should. That the infinite wisdom of God is on display in these people, bought by the blood of Christ, redeemed by the cross of Christ, made into the family of Christ, called the church. That's the first reason why we must love the church. Because she is the display of God's manifold wisdom. But she is even more not only is the church the display of God's wisdom, but second, the church is the place of the Spirit's dwelling. The church is the place of, it, of the Spirit's dwelling. Look again at verse 9 of chapter, uh, sorry, 19 of chapter 2 there. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him, you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Paul is helping us see the church as a temple 
being put together with living stones, Christ Jesus himself, the cornerstone, were built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, the word of God, and growing into a holy temple in which God himself dwells by the Holy Spirit. You know, a lot of Bible teachers say that the whole story of the Bible is the story of God dwelling with his people. Of course, it begins in the garden, right? Genesis 1 and 2 with Adam and Eve, God dwelling with them, having perfect fellowship with them. They sin, they rebel, they fail. They're exiled from God's presence. And the rest of the Bible story is the story of God making a way. Making a way for sinners to live in his presence. Making a way for him, the holy God, to dwell among us. We, we see this in the wilderness as Israel was wandering. God dwelled with them in a pillar of cloud and fire. Uh, we see this even as they build the tabernacle. God comes and fills the innermost room, the Holy of Holies, with his glory. Later when Solomon builds the temple, 1 Kings chapter 8, God's glory comes down and fills the temple and those who are there worshipping could not even stand because of how amazing this was. And of course we see it preeminently. John chapter 1. In our Lord Jesus Christ, the eternal word of God made flesh. The text says, the word was made flesh and dwelled among us. And we have beheld his glory. And then that word made flesh, the son of God, fully God, fully man, died, rose again, ascended into heaven and sent forth his spirit from God the Father, proceeding from God the Father, And God the Son, the third person of the Trinity, God the Holy Spirit, comes and fills the people of God and dwells in us. Dwells not only in us individually, but in us as a people. Makes us his house, his temple. And not just his house, he makes us his home, his household. That's the other term Paul uses there. This means we are the dwelling place of God and the family of God, as we sang. The Spirit of God dwells every Christian, every believer individually, those who are united to Christ by faith. But the emphasis in the New Testament is that he dwells preeminently in us as the church. By the way, that is why church unity is so important to the Lord, because this is his own family, right? That's why Paul says in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 3, he says to be eager, that we are to be eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit, the unity which the Spirit gives in the bond of peace. This is why elsewhere in 1 Corinthians, Paul pronounces a strong warning about division in the church. 1 Corinthians 3 is talking about the church and divisions that had uh, taken place. And Paul says this, chapter 3, verse 16. Do you not know that you, uh, plural you, the church, are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is holy and you are that temple. You know, several years ago, I was in a a part of the United States called Vermont, very cold, very rural, and we were part of a church, just a lot of wonderful, servant-hearted, simple, humble, faithful saints, and we loved their fellowship. And I remember we were in a Bible study on Ephesians chapter 2. And we were studying this, these verses, the end of chapter 2. And, and there was a brother there who, you know, he started processing this out loud. And he said, so uh, I, I just want to understand. What you're saying is uh, the, 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 the holy of holies in which God came down and, and, and he was there inside that cube in the inside of the temple. Are you saying that the same way that God was in that cube, the, the Holy of Holies, the innermost place in the temple, that God is in us? Is that, is that what that's saying? And I said, oh yeah, that's absolutely what that's saying. And you're like, well, well wh- what are we doing sitting around then? We should be on fire. Amen. 
We should be on fire, brothers and sisters. Does it set your heart on fire? Does it set your heart ablaze to think that this is who we are as the church of the Lord Jesus Christ? We are the dwelling place of the spirit of God himself. And in his church, God receives the glory of which he is worthy. Think about chapter 3 and verse 21. Paul is saying to him, to him, to the Lord, be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. We love the church because she is the display of God's wisdom. And second, because she is the place of the Spirit's dwelling. But thirdly and most importantly, we love the church because she is the object of Christ's love. And by now you're wondering, why do I keep saying she, she? Shouldn't it be it? Well, I want to point you to Ephesians chapter 5, verses 25 to 26. Here in this text, Paul is instructing husbands on how they should love their wives. And he tells them the example is how Christ loved his church. Listen to these words. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. And gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. You know, the rest of that passage teaches that this was why marriage itself was created by God and instituted by God. Marriage itself was created to give us a picture, a small picture and glimpse of the love that Christ has for the church. The great theologian Jonathan Edwards once said that the entire world was created so that the eternal Son of God might obtain a spouse. And of course, he's right, right? When you go to the end of the Bible, Revelation chapter 22, where does it all end? The Bible ends with the marriage supper of the Lamb, with the glorious Son of God, our Lord Jesus Christ, being united forever to the bride he has purchased by his own blood. And we will see his face. One of the greatest privileges I have in pastoral ministry is where I get to stand at weddings. You know, when I'm officiating weddings, and I've done a few of yours, I get to stand here, facing this way, watching the bride come down the aisle. Beautiful, radiant, filled with longing and excitement. And I get to look at the groom, and to see his eyes filled with such joy and delight and longing and passion. And he looks at his bride and she's absolutely perfect to him in every way. And he can't wait to be united to her. I get to watch as they make their vows to one another and lead them in that and look at the exchanges of eyes and to the groom on the wedding day. She is beautiful. Oh, she is beloved. You know, that's just a small picture of how Jesus looks at his church. What do you think Jesus sees when he looks at his church? Do you think he sees all of the flaws of the church? All of our many shortcomings and failures and the way that we as a church fail him often? Do you think he sees every wrinkle and blemish in us? He is the holy, spotless son of God who is absolutely perfect in his righteousness and holiness. When he looks at us, when he looks at the church, do you think he just sees a ragtag group of wretched sinners, though we sin in so many ways? No, brothers and sisters, that's not how Jesus looks at his church. 
He looks at his church and he sees his beautiful, beloved, blood-bought bride. He sees the one whom he died to save. He sees the one whom he died to purify. The one whom he shed his blood to make his own, to wash her and cleanse her, to cleanse us and present us before him holy and without blemish and without spot. Jesus sees the church as beautiful and beloved. And I want to ask you, is that how you look at her? You know, I must confess. Confession time. I fail so miserably at this. A lot of the time, I, I struggle and I sin. Because as a pastor, you know, I'm, I'm probably privy to the struggles and flaws of the church more than any of you. And I'm so often thinking about what's wrong, (laughs) what do we need to fix, where do we need to grow, that I can grow very critical and pessimistic and fail to just look at the church in her breathtaking beauty. Listen to these words from Dustin Benj in this excellent book. This is called The Loveliest Place, The Beauty and Glory of the Church. Listen to what he says. The church is beautiful. Beautiful is not a phrase we often associate with the church. Words like organization, mission, vision, and even body come to mind, but not beautiful. We like helpful organizational charts that describe the purpose and function of the church. We want to place her members in properly assigned roles and duties. We underscore the qualifications and responsibilities of church leaders. We emphasize the church's theology and mission among the nations. We even pinpoint and seem to critique her problems and failures endlessly. We consider what the church can give us and do for us, how she can serve us, and even what's in it for us. But rarely do we enjoy the eye-opening and soul-stirring truth that she is beautiful and lovely in just being who she is. Listen to these words. The church has played a central role in so many of our lives. She has nurtured us in times of grief. She has shepherded us in valleys of despair and instructed us in seasons of growth. We love her people. We love her ministries. We love her worship. We love her teaching. We love her comfort Do we love her? Do you love her, dear brothers and sisters? Is your heart moved with passion at the sound of her name? Are you filled with joy at the thought of being with her people? You may be here this morning and you have never been part of the church. You have never known Christ and his love for sinners and how he makes us his family, his bride. And and if you're here, dear non-Christian friend, I want to speak to you. You too can enjoy this. You can become a part of this family. You can have your sins washed away and become part of the bride of Christ. It's open to you this morning, dear friend. You see, all of us are sinners. None of us are worthy to be here. All of us have sinned and failed and fallen short in miserable ways. And we don't deserve this. We don't deserve to be a part of the people of God, the bride of Christ. We deserve condemnation and judgment. Because God is holy. And we have sinned and broken his laws. But he has been loving in such a great way as this. That he sent his own son, our Lord Jesus Christ. The son of God. Fully God. Fully man. Who lived the perfect life that we could never live. And then he died. As a substitute and a sacrifice for sinners, Jesus died. He died. His hands were nailed to a cross. He was held up naked and ashamed before a whole crowd of mocking people. And he took upon himself our condemnation, our guilt, our shame, the penalty for our sins was upon him on that cross. And he was covered in darkness as he endured the wrath of God and the curse of God towards sinners and poured out his blood and died 
so that by his blood, he would purify us, he would cleanse us, he would take those of us who are far off and bring us near, make us his perfect spotless bride. And he has done exactly that. He rose from the dead and he summons you, dear non-Christian friend. You can have the forgiveness of your sins today. You can enjoy the mercy of God in Christ today. Grace towards sinners in Jesus Christ that you can receive eternal life today and look forward to that wedding day when the bride of Christ will be united to him forever. Today, eternal life is yours. Membership in the people of God is yours. If you will turn from your sin and flee to Christ, trust in this Savior. Dear friends, brothers and sisters, the church has been made beautiful by the blood of Christ, the Son of God. The beauty and glory that she radiates is his own beauty. The glory of the Father radiated through the Son, reflected by his bride, his church. Now, I've been in ministry for several years and I've had a, a lot of different experiences and I've had a number of people. It's no strange thing for any person in ministry that you have people who don't like you. And sometimes I've even had people tell me, yeah, I don't like you. And I'm, yeah, it's okay, you know. You win some, you lose some. But you know one thing that's never happened, I've never had anybody come to me and say, uh, you know, Pastor Aubrey, I like you, I love your ministry, I just don't like your wife very much. I'd love a relationship with you, but ah, Nishika, I mean, I've no one's ever said, I mean, how could they say that? She's so sweet. Right? If we say that we love Jesus, so also should we love his bride. Now, this beautiful incident in the book of Acts where Saul, uh, the apostle Paul, before he was converted, was headed to Damascus to persecute the church there. He had letters to arrest these Christians, maybe even put some of them to death. And on the road, he meets the risen Christ himself. And Saul is just blinded by the glory of Christ. And here's Jesus speaking to him. And Jesus says this, he, he doesn't say, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting those Christians there in Damascus? He doesn't even say, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting the local church in Damascus? No, Jesus says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Jesus so identifies with the local church in Damascus, that he calls that congregation me. Spurgeon said, Nothing in this world is nearer to God's heart than his church. Therefore, being his, let us also belong to it, that by our prayers, our gifts, and our labors, we may support and strengthen it. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the gift of your church the bride of your son who shed his blood to make us his. And we pray by the power of your spirit, you would grow in us to love the church as you love the church and to devote our lives to serving you in the company of your saints. In Jesus' name, amen.